In my latest on location video, several viewers brought up a question slash suggestion that's come up many times before in previous on location videos. And um, whenever I hear this notion come up, my immediate reaction is to just brush it off and be like, eh, thanks for the suggestion, but not for me. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized, you know, this is actually an interesting jumping off point for a, uh, a bit of a philosophical discussion in regards to photography. And uh, I thought it might even be interesting enough to make a video. And so here we are. Uh, so break out your brandy snifter and tobacco pipe, because we're about to get philosophical up in here. So the question in question is um, something along the lines of, why didn't you move the thing? Or why didn't you ask the business owner to do the thing? Basically, why didn't you manipulate the scene to get it more the way you wanted before you made your exposure? And um, I thought it was an interesting thing to talk about because where do you draw the line on altering the scene or manipulating your subject? Not only that, where, where do you draw the line on digital manipulation? Um, and you know, there's no definite right or wrong answer on this. I think it is a discussion and it's interesting. So I'm not here to lecture you on what I think is the right uh, place to draw that line. Uh, it's up for each one of us to decide, but it is worth talking about. So just to give you an example of, of what I'm talking about here, uh, in the latest video I was photographing a donut shop called Sweet O Donuts, and there was a monument sign next to the building that does light up, but it happened to turn off just before I took my first exposures. And I was a little unhappy about that because I wanted the monument sign to be on. And so some viewers suggested, why not go up to the business owner and coordinate leaving it on? And you can come back another day to turn it on, or maybe even in that moment you could walk up and have them turn it back on. Now, when I hear suggestions like this, my immediate reaction is, hell no, no way. I would never even think of doing that. But I'm not saying I'm right and you're wrong. I'm just saying to me, it's not even an option. Uh, someone has also suggested, hey, you should have moved that trash can. But again, hell no, I ain't touching the scene. Another shot in this same video, I was photographing a little strip mall and there were a bunch of orange cones um, out in front and I didn't like them. And a few people said, why not just move the cones? And I get it, logical, makes sense. But um, again, hell no. Uh, on that one, partly because I can't be sure, but I'm pretty sure it's a crime to uh, move safety equipment for government road workers. So I certainly wasn't gonna touch those. But even if they weren't for government road workers, I probably still wouldn't have touched them. But clearly, um, I'm not opposed to any influence on my subject. Because after all, when I was photographing Houston's liquor, a big semi truck drove right in front of me, blocking my view. And I was more than happy to go up to him and ask him to move. I actually gave him 20 bucks uh, to move. And side note, I know 20 bucks is a lot to have a guy move a truck, but uh, it, if I had had two ones on me or a five, that's definitely what I would have given him. I only had 20s. And I hate just asking people to do stuff without giving them something in exchange. Anyway, so I was willing to ask a truck driver to move his truck from a scene so that I could photograph it the way I wanted, but I'm completely unwilling to coordinate with a business owner to leave the lights on or to leave the monument sign on or to move a trash can or cones out of the scene. And then so it started me thinking like, well, what the hell is going on in my head really? Where am I drawing the line and why does one thing seem so repulsive to me and another thing, which is really no different, doesn't bother me at all. And so I've been thinking a lot about it and I uh, thought it was kind of worth going through it here. I think it's good to start with a, a bit of a thought experiment. Um, and we're gonna do it with a, a photo from Ansel Adams. So Ansel Adams took this photo um, in California and it's in the Owens Valley, Valley area. And there's this nice little horse off in uh, a field and great little spot of light on it. And it's obviously a beautiful photo, one of his, uh, his famous iconic shots. Now, what if I had told you, what if you learned that that horse was brought in by Ansel Adams? That he found a local ranch hand with a horse, paid him money to trailer the horse out to that field, place him in just the right spot, and he timed it and got the, everything coordinated just right, and he brought that horse in to create the photo that he had envisioned. Now, the question is, would that alter your feelings about the photo or make you lose any respect for the photographer? Personally, the answer to both of those questions is yes. 
I would feel vastly different about this photo if I knew Ansel Adams planted that horse there, and I would lose a lot of respect for him. Again, I'm not saying that's right. It's just in my brain, he would become a very different photographer, a very different person, and this photograph would become a completely different thing. Now let's look at another. This one by Peter Lick, which I am no fan of Peter Lick, but this is actually a great example because this is manipulated. Peter Lick or his tour guide, whoever, somebody threw a, a little bit of dust into the column of light and that created this image. And I can't confirm this, but I can almost guarantee that that cloud of dust is also digitally, digitally manipulated to look more like a person. Pretty much guaranteed. If I know Peter Lick, which I don't, but I do. Um, I can pretty much guarantee this is also digitally manipulated. But also, it's just some guy throwing dust into a shaft of light. So personally, I have really zero respect for this photo, and I think a lot of people would fall into that camp, largely because it's Peter Lake. But many people wouldn't. Many people wouldn't care. So landscapey type stuff. You know, these are landscape examples, and having any sort of photographer manipulation of the subject can be kind of repulsive in a landscape photo. If you knew that a photographer had moved a given rock into just the right position, or they, you know, uh, moved branches into, the, into a spot to be looking just how they want, it would probably turn you off, uh, or at least I think it would turn most people off. But how about like street photography or photojournalism? Like, couple of photos from Vivian Meyer here. Let's say this one here, this guy's sleeping in his car. What if you found out that Vivian Meyer had come up to this guy who was wide awake and said, hey, make it look like you're sleeping in the car and I'll take a cute little photo here. You'd probably feel a lot different about the shot. Or this one here, you know, if this was just a guy and his son standing on the street, uh, not really doing anything, and she walked up and said, hey, let's do something kind of cute here. Uh, lift up his foot, look at the bottom, and then little boy, look, look over at me, look over at me the photo would lose all credibility and interest. So with street photography, we have kind of that kind of same reaction of like, if you feel the photographer has orchestrated what you're looking at, it's a problem. And yet, there's plenty of street photos where it is clear that the photographer has orchestrated the photo and yet it doesn't bother anybody. Like these two here, these are also by Vivian Meyer, both clearly posed and both incredible photos nonetheless. So she obviously went up to some people and said, hey, pose for a shot or got their attention or whatever. They noticed her and it was very clearly posed, very clearly the photographer has manipulated the scene to get the photo and yet not repulsive. And so there's not even a hard fast rule within one genre of photography. It's not like all street photography should never be posed or never be orchestrated by the photographer. It really depends on what the viewer is expecting out of the photograph and whether they feel they're being lied to. If you know that the photographer orchestrated the photo, because you can tell that the subjects are posing because the photographer told them to, no problem. But if the photo is trying to be passed off as something that happened naturally, some decisive moment that happened completely naturally, and then you find out later that, oh, it wasn't uh, a, a natural organic moment, then we get pissed off. How about photojournalism? Photojournalism is a big one because uh, artistic integrity and journalistic integrity is very important in uh, photojournalism. So let's look at probably the most famous, the most iconic, maybe the most recognizable photo in all of at least American history. And that's the raising of the flag at uh, Iwo Jima by Joe Rosenthal. And uh, I'm sure everybody has seen this photo, but this is an incredible, iconic photo. Clearly looks like a, a, a real moment but um, there's an interesting backstory to this photo. So Joe Rosenthal was a war photographer uh, for World War II here. And um, the way it worked back then is the photographer would take a bunch of pictures, but they wouldn't develop them themselves. And they wouldn't get to see the photos before other people did because they were on the front lines. So they would take a bunch of rolls, take a bunch of pictures, send those, those rolls off to get developed at some base somewhere away from the front lines. They would get developed. Someone else would look through them and then the photographer wouldn't see him until quite a bit later. And then so when Joe Rosenthal took this picture and, and sent off the rolls, uh, word had gotten around that he had taken some incredible photo of soldiers on the top of the hill at Iwo Jima. And someone came up to him and, and asked, hey, that photo with the soldiers and the flag at the top of the hill, was that posed? 
And his response was, yeah, of course. Of course it was posed. And immediately, like everyone's reaction changes. You know, if you hear that now, you're probably thinking, oh, well, how important is that photo really then, if it's posed? Now it turns out, Joe Rosenthal had taken a second photo on that same hill. He had actually come down after doing the raising of the flag. Uh, I don't know what to do, maybe switch cameras or something, but then he went back up to the hill later on and took this photo. So again, soldiers on the top of the hill with the flag. So when this person asked him, hey, that photo of the soldiers with the flag on the top of the hill, was that posed? He was picturing this one. And so his reaction was, of course it was posed, idiot. Look at them, they're posing. He thought they were referring to this one. He didn't even make the connection that they might be referring to that snapshot, that quick shot he took earlier when they were raising the flag. So for the briefest of times, people thought maybe this original uh, raising the flag at Iwo Jima was posed. And that completely changes the context. It completely changes the value of the photo uh, because we expect it to be a real moment. How about architectural photography? So I'm big on architectural photography. Uh, one of my favorites, well actually my absolute favorite, is Julius Shulman. And here's a photo he took. Now, in looking at this photo, this looks like a couple of people hanging out in a room kind of naturally without, the photog without knowing the photographer's there really. Um, would it really change your feeling about the photo if you knew that these people were posed and placed there and he brought in lighting and he arranged the furniture just how he wanted and he posed them just how he wanted? Would that change your feeling about the photo or the feeling about the photographer? For me, no, not at all. I expect this is probably posed, I'm sure it is, and he brought in all the lighting and everything, so I'm sure it's posed and it doesn't bother me that it is. You know, when I do architectural photography, I'm constantly rearranging furniture and creating little quote-unquote lies by bringing in furniture from one room to another and clear, clear, clearing out the area and making it look better than it actually is. Is that uh, wrong? Is that crossing the line? I think most people would agree, no, it's not. So architectural photography, we've got different standards too. This one, fashion photography. Would it really bother you to know that, hey, those elephants weren't really there next to the model just randomly and the photographer showed up? It wasn't a natural organic moment. No, of course not. It's obviously posed so it doesn't bother us. How about fine art photography? Gregory Crutzen's one of my favorites. He has these incredible scenes where everything is entirely manipulated by the photographer. They are hired models with big studio Hollywood lighting. They, he has a whole crew, he has fake fog with fog machines, he has gaffers and grips and all these guys to operate the lighting and brings in models and closed down streets and everything. Some of them are complete fabricated sets on a sound stage. It's all completely artificial. And not only that, many of his photos are digitally manipulated. They're combinations of multiple frames or things can be airbrushed out or added in. Does that reduce the value of his photos? Personally, no. He's one of my favorites. But I'm kind of expecting there to be some sort of manipulation. So my whole point up until this, this point is um, we have different lines that we consider being crossed for different genres. You know, what you consider okay manipulation for a, an architectural shot might not be acceptable for a landscape photo or what's acceptable for a uh, fine art posed kind of uh, artistic rendition might be okay, but no way on street photography, but within even the same genre. A picture of a street photo that looks posed, no problem, we know the photographer did that, we know they influenced the scene, but a scene that looks like it's supposed to be natural, it bothers us. So really, what is that line that's being crossed? Now, this isn't even to say anything about digital manipulation yet, which we'll get to. But on this notion of uh, actually manipulating the scene, I just want to give you one last example and ask how you felt about it. So I took this photo here um, in the deserts of California and 6x17 shot at dusk, got this nice chair. Now, how would it make you feel if I told you that I actually bought that chair at Goodwill um, previously, I dirtied it up, I slashed it and made it all dirty and had a bunch of bird shit added to it and everything. And then I actually trucked that all the way to the gas station, put it in there, put it in just the right spot so that I could get this composition. How would you feel about the photo? And how would you feel about me as a photographer? Probably not good, I'm betting. Luckily, none of that happened. This was actually there. I didn't touch it. I didn't move it. I didn't do anything. 
but that's something that is technically not unlike a Greg Recruitsen photo. I, I'm not doing it for photojournalism. It's not street photography. It's kind of architectural photography, kind of landscape. So why would it bother, bother some of us in that instance when it's not even really like a, you know, National Geographic type photo where we're not okay with manipulation? So these lines get very fuzzy and they get very gray uh, depending on who's taking it and what you're expecting of the photographer and what the subject matter actually is. Now let's talk a little bit about the digital manipulation side of it. Let's start with um, my old pal Peter Lick because uh, I like to start off with the worst examples and move forward from there. So here's two photos taken by Peter Lick. Giant moons and um, obviously these are, these are fake. These are Photoshop. They're complete digital manipulations. Now you know how I know that? Look at both of them and look at the cloud cover in the sky. Notice anything weird? There's cloud cover behind the moon in both of them. I'm going to say that again because I don't think they heard me way in the back. There's cloud cover behind the moon. And these are photos he gladly put out for sale. Quick side note, funny, this one here, when I was doing research for this video, I came across this picture and there were all these things online of like photographers are calling out Peter Lick for this, this picture being fake. And I think, um, you know, Schmo's nose or uh, I think I got his name right. But I think he did a video where it's like confirmed fake Peter Lick. This, this photo is a confirmed fake. Yeah, no shit. There's clouds behind the moon. Yes, it's fake. Now, most people ridicule these photos. Uh, any photographer who knows what they're talking about would ridicule these photos because it's horrible digital manipulation for one, but also it's misleading uh, digital manipulation. Like, he tries to pass it off like he's some natural uh, wild, wildland photographer with his tripod slung over his shoulder, but most of his work is clearly being done in the computer. So, that turns people off. But there's some that are a little more interesting, a little more subtle. Let's look at this photo here. So this is a photo from, uh, I think, the war in Syria. This was taken by a photographer by the name of uh, Narcisco Contreras. And um, if you look at this photo here, it doesn't really look like anything could have been photoshopped. Pretty normal, normal photojournalistic type shot. But if we look at the original, you'll see in the lower left, there's a video camera from one of the other reporters on scene that um, Narcisco Contreras photoshopped out because he felt it was distracting. Now, does that alter the core communication of the photo? Does that alter the core essence, the important part of the photo? Obviously, no, it doesn't. And yet, this photographer was fired from his job as a photojournalist because of this minor adjustment to the photo. So we have issues with it, even when it doesn't necessarily alter the intrinsic uh, communication of the photo. Let's look at one more. Uh, this is kind of a famous one from uh, Nat Geo. And uh, this photo here, uh, the cover of the magazine, looks pretty, you know, normal. Looks natural. And how could anyone get bent out of shape out of this? Well, it turns out this photo was manipulated digitally. But here's the crazy part. This is the original. So here's the cover. Here's the original. And the cover is actually digitally manipulated. And by the way, people tore National Geographic a, a new asshole over this. They did not like that the photo on the cover had been digitally manipulated and it was a turning point for National Geographic where they kind of drew the line. We're never doing any sort of digital manipulation like this ever again. But look at them. Where's the digital manipulation? It doesn't even look like it. Now I'll outline what would be the cover on the original photo and compare it to the cover now. You can see yeah, there is digital manipulation. All they did was move the two pyramids a little closer together so that you could include those three, uh, three people on camels and still see both pyramids in the vertical orientation of the National Geographic cover. That is not a manipulation that alters the intrinsic communication of the photo. It's simply making it fit into the rectangle of the cover more easily. And yet, people had a big, big problem with it. Now, when it comes to fine art or anything else, it's kind of up to the photographer. This famous 
a photo by Andreas Gursky, Rhine 2, um, which sold for $4 million, something like that. He openly says, yeah, it's digitally manipulated. I think he removed some things in the photo. So it evidently didn't bother the guy who bought it for $4 million. So digital manipulation isn't always a problem. But if, you know, landscapey type stuff, if you found out that this rainbow was added digitally in this photo that Galen Rowell took, probably bother you. Um, just like if, you know, there's a beautiful landscape with an epic f uh, fiery sunset and then you find out later that was added digitally later, it can be a little bit of a turnoff. So you see this whole thing is kind of a mess. We don't really have clearly defined lines on what's okay to do in terms of scene manipulation and digital manipulation. But this brings me to, I guess, my conclusion. And um, I'll just tell you where I draw the line. In terms of scene manipulation, my feeling is uh, when I go out to do photography, uh, especially personal work, I'm there to photograph that moment in time the way it is uh, without my interference. I'm the fly on the wall that's capturing it. And so anything I would potentially do to alter that scene completely changes the story. And so I'm no longer doing the type of photography I set out to do. I am fabricating something. But if I'm at a location and I've set up a shot, so again, this donut, uh, donut shop photo. Let's say I have the shot set up and then some car just parks on the street right in front of me. I have no problem telling them to move because it has nothing to do with the moment in time I'm trying to capture with this particular subject. They're not affiliated with the building. They're not customers going in. So I have every right to tell them to, hey, man, I set up a shot. Can you get out of here? But oddly enough, if they went in and parked in a parking spot in the parking lot of the building, that's off limits. I'm not touching them. So anything that would change the intrinsic communication, the core essence of the photo that I'm trying to make is off limits to me. Even if it's something uh, unappealing to me, like the monument sign not turning on, or a trash can that I don't like where it's placed perfectly, then that's off limits. I can't touch it. Now, of course, this depends on what the purpose of the photo is. For my personal work, for the YouTube stuff you see, for my portfolio, those are the rules I abide by. But when I'm doing architectural photography for a client, they're expecting a great looking building. They don't care what my artis artistic integrity is in terms of moving a couch three feet this way or that way. So yeah, I'll move anything they want me to move. And I will change the sky out even if they want that. I hate doing that. I don't like digital manipulation like that. But if they want a new sky, guess what, customer? You're getting it. So you have to look at the end product. Who's receiving the photo and what are their expectations? And the interesting thing is a lot of different types of photography have an understood, assumed um, level of what's okay and what's expected. People expect landscape photographers to not touch the landscape. So even though the photographer didn't say I didn't touch anything, we expect landscape photographers to not touch the scene. And so when you find out that they did move a rock here to make it look a little better, instant hack, get out of here. But architectural photography, we kind of expect them to clean up the scene, to rake the carpet, to sweep it up, to move the furniture where it should go. We expect that of architectural photography. And so it doesn't bother us when we find out that's been done. Same goes for digital manipulation. You know, if, if it's a type of photography where digital manipulation is kind of par for the course, then it doesn't tend to bother people. And it shouldn't really bother you if you're the photographer. Um, but if it's photojournalism, if it's street photography, then maybe people are gonna have a problem with you airbrushing something out or adding something in or changing the sky or combining multiple photos. With the type of photography that I do where I'm photographing a lot of buildings at dawn and dusk, I don't view those as architectural photography. I don't view them as landscape photography. I don't view them as street photography. They're a hybrid of all three, in my opinion, because I'm trying to capture a moment in time, which is more like street photography. I'm capturing a building, which is like architectural, but I'm also capturing the entire scene, and I would be sorely um, ashamed to say that I've altered it in any way, which is more of a landscape photography thing. So, again, my point here is I'm not trying to lecture you. I'm telling you, just figure out where the lines are for yourself. 
They don't have to match up with mine at all. They don't have to match up with anybody's baby. Whatever your line is, you will find an entire support group around you that's gonna agree with you wholeheartedly, 100%. There's an entire community that thinks digital manipulation out the wazoo is completely fine. Liquefy that bitch, change the sky, remove that, combine multiple pictures, go crazy, man. And you'll have a whole community that agrees with you on that. I tend to be in a community where it's expected that you're not gonna do much heavy manipulation. That's part, of, that's a film photography thing, I think, largely. Film photographers tend to expect that the, uh, the shooter isn't gonna alter the scene too much, especially digitally. So when I'm doing digital manipulation, it's just color balance, contrast, maybe airbrushing out uh, something that, you know, like a piece of trash in the grass in the foreground. I might remove that. But beyond that, no bueno. So it's an interesting discussion. Where do we draw the line on image manipulation? I'm sure I didn't give you any answers here, but I hope you enjoyed the video nonetheless. Thanks for watching. If you feel like you enjoyed it and you want to help support more of these videos, visit nickcarverphoto.com contribute, and um, see you next time. Thank you.